recall that we have seen the definition of a tautology and contradiction. Yeah, and uh, propositional formula S is said to be a tautology if it is true for all valuations. What is a valuation? Valuation is a function, it is a two valued function from 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 SL to uh, truth or false or equivalently from L. Yeah, I mean the function from SL to true false that satisfies certain conditions whereas the function from L to true false does not need to satisfy any conditions. You understand that? Okay, a contradiction is a statement which is always false. Can you give me an example of a contradiction? P conjunction negation P is always false. P disjunction negation P is always true. And uh, two formulas are said to be logically equivalent if their valuations are the same. Now, today what we are going to do in the first part is instead of looking at a single formula at a time, we are going to look at a collection of formulas. Okay? So, uh, let T be a subset of SL. And now we want to define what does it mean for T to be tautologous. So, say that T is tautologous if, can you guess what it should be? Yes. If V of S is equal to T for all, oh, I, actually this is a bad choice, right? I should say S. I am going to make that change. We say that S is tautologous if V of S is true for all S in S and all valuations V. Okay, say that S is contradictory if any guesses? If what? Loudly. Every element in uh, S is contradiction, that's not the case. For any value. Yes. If For any valuation B, there is S in S such that V of S is false. So see, uh, tautologous, there is no need to give me exam uh, give any examples. Yeah, it's just a bunch of tautologies. Whereas here I need to give you some examples. So for example, P comma negation P is contradictory. You see that if a valuation makes P true, then this is false. And if a valuation makes P false, then this is false. So together, yeah, together it is contradictory. So basically what is happening? that, uh, I mean in very simple terms, if you consider the Lindenbaum Tarski algebra, then these two elements or their logical equivalence classes, they will generate the full filter, the full Boolean algebra. Can you see why? If you consider P and you consider negation P, both of them are in the filter but a filter is closed under finite meets. So therefore, P is there, negation P is there, so their meet is there, what is meet? 
not zero, okay, or the, con of the contradiction. So basically, this set together generates a contradiction. It is capable of generating a contradiction. Okay, that is what contradictory means. So it's basically like uh, in real life also we do something like this, right? Uh, there are uh, there is a group of friends and they have contradictory opinions. Correct? So one person says P, another person says negation P. So it's not that individually they are problematic. But as a group, they are problematic. I mean their opinions are problematic. So they contradict each other. Yes? Okay. Now, let us go back and say, say that S is uh, say that S is satisfiable if there is a valuation such that V of S is equal to true for all S in S. You understand this? <coughs> Satisfiable means some valuation. Yeah, there are so many valuations. But at least one valuation makes all the formulas in capital S true. Okay. Any problems? Uh, can you give me one example of a satisfiable set? Singleton P, yes. Any other in two variables, let's say? Well, let's write something more complicated. For example, this is satisfiable. Yeah, given any anything, you can determine whether it is satisfiable, contradictory. What you have to do is you have to construct truth tables for all the formulas in capital S and make sure that there is at least one row of the truth table which makes all those formulas true. Okay. Any problems here? Let us proceed with that. So these three are the basic definitions and now what we are look, going to look at is how one statement is a logical consequence of a bunch of statements. Okay? So let's go ahead. Suppose S is a subset of SL and P is a single formula. Say that P is a logical consequence of S if there is if uh, sorry if whenever a valuation V satisfies S then V of T is true. Okay, maybe I should go back a bit to this previous one. Yeah, whenever we say that S is satisfiable, yeah, uh, so this particular valuation, uh, here we write, V of S is true. What is the meaning of V of capital S being true? That V of small s is true for all s. Or, 
I forgot to mention this. The models capital S. Yeah, uh, read <coughs> V models capital S or V is a model of capital S. So this is called a double turnstile symbol. Okay, let me write this thing for you. So this is a so this is a double turnstile. So this double turnstile is actually a semantic notion. Why semantic? Because we are talking about valuations. Valuations have to do with truth and false. And truth and false are human constructs. Yeah, humans understand them. So therefore, this is a syntactic turnstile, double turnstile. The single turnstile which we will see today itself, single turnstile is a syntactic construct. Okay? So that is more about formality. This is more about understanding. And completeness theorem will say <coughs> that those two are equal. Okay. So uh, okay. So uh, let us go over it again. <coughs> so say that S is satisfiable if there is a valuation V such that V of capital S is true which means V of little s is true for all s, small s in capital S. All the formulas in s are true. In other words, what do we write? That V models s. Okay? And now, let us come to the next definition and what it is saying that whenever V is a model of capital S, then V is a model of small t. Yeah, let me write that. In other words, if V models S, then V models T for all valuations. And in this whole thing for all valuations, V. Now, look at what's happening here. I mean, this is a consequence. Whenever we think about consequence, then it's always an if-then type of situation. If this happens, then that happens. So, this is also a material implication. I mean, conditional implication. If V models S, then V models T. So, when is this a logical, I mean, uh, recall what is the truth value of implication, what is the truth table of implication, when you want to, when do you say that P implies Q is true, when P is false or Q is true, or in other words, whenever P is true, then Q is true, right, we are doing the same thing here. For all valuations, whenever S is satisfied by V, then T is satisfied by V. Okay, so it is a logical consequence. So we are given a bunch of statements and from those statements together, we can conclude something. In simple terms, in Boolean algebra terms, what it is trying to say is also very simple. That this t, this little t actually lies in the filter generated by capital S. That's all. Little t lies in the filter generated by the logical equivalence classes of capital S. 
let us look at an example then you will understand it more oh yeah and uh, what is the notation here we write t is a logical consequence of s if t is a logical consequence of s well it's not a tautology okay one is in symbols another one is in words so there are two different ways in which we can use the double turn style symbol what is the first way valuation on the left hand side and a bunch of statements on the right hand side and here we are saying a bunch of statements but only one on the left hand side but only one statement on the right hand side Okay, so let us look at an example. Without that, we cannot really proceed. So, for example, if I am given P and Q, then from that I can conclude P. Yeah, this is a no-brainer. Yeah, if there is a valuation which makes P and Q both true. then the same valuation will make p true then if there is a valuation which makes p and q both true then it will make p disjunction q true if there is a valuation which makes p and q true then it will also make p conjunction q true now here uh let us look at these things in the boolean algebra sense what is happening the filter generated by p and q that contains p the filter generated by p and q because it's an upward closed set it contains p disjunction q and because the filter generated by p and q is closed under finite meets it contains p conjunction q any doubts <laughs> i'm not going to draw pictures because it's a four atom 16 element boolean algebra it will take lot of time but you can draw them and you can realize logical consequence is nothing but that a particular element lies in the filter generated by the left hand side and you already know what is meaning what is the meaning of filter generated by a set yes it is the smallest filter containing that and how did we construct that by first closing it under finite meets and then upper bounds okay so uh, give me one other example of logical consequence how about this p implies p is a logical consequence of nothing whenever a valuation makes left hand side true where every valuation makes left hand side true what is the left hand side <coughs> empty there is nothing so every valuation makes left hand side true and every valuation makes right hand side true so this is actually a remark what should i write so nothing uh, implies t if and only if t is a correct Okay, so I mean you can always use it with empty set. This double turn style symbol you can use with empty set. On the left hand side, the right hand side must be <coughs> empty. Okay. Uh, 
so do you understand this now now there is some philosophical talk here that if i have some information and then i get some more information then whatever i could conclude from the original information that should still remain valid in real life this doesn't happen we simply get confused if i be as strongly believe that two of my friends are truth tellers one person tells me p another person tells me negation p then i simply get confused whereas in this kind of logic this is a very fundamental and classical but basic logic which is a very crude approximation of human understanding so if we get two contradictory pieces of information then actually we can uh, what can we conclude from that if i have written p and negation p here then what can i conclude from that everything right so basically even if i get some extra information then i'm not going to decrease my set of consequences i will in fact add more things as i go along and that the simple concept is that the filter generated by s and filter generated by s prime which is superset if s prime is a superset of s then the filter generated by s is a subset of filter generated by s prime so i'm going to write down two different things first one another remark so this is let's say remark 1 and remark 2 if s is contradictory and t is anything then i can conclude anything from contradiction okay let us look at this statement again let me go back to the definition of contradictory what is the meaning of contradictory that for every valuation there is a formula which is not true so basically capital s cannot be true for any valuation there does not exist a valuation v such that v of capital s is true so therefore now come here if s is contradictory then the left hand side can never be true so left hand side is always false and in our definition of truth of implication if the uh, the if part is false then the implication is true so no matter what i put on the right hand side it is always true are you getting that and the reason being simply that if s is contradictory then it generates the whole boolean algebra as a filter right so any t is an upper bound of 0 and 0 belongs to the filter so therefore because of being up, upward close set upset we get that t lies in that filter so contradiction implies anything so basically a liar can say anything right you cannot really believe yeah the right hand side is anything any nonsense can be derived from a contradictory bunch of statements okay now the next part that was i was talking about is called monotonicity 
monotonicity of the turnstile operator or the logical consequence operator if S is a subset of S prime and they are both sets of propositional formulas and T is any statement then if T is a logical consequence of S then T is also a logical consequence of S prime So monotonicity, we have heard this term before, right? What is a monotone map? Order preserving. Now which order are we talking about here? We are talking about the inclusion order, this one. S is a subset of S prime. So S can increase but still the logical consequences the original logical consequences are preserved. That is monotonic logic. So there are many logics which are non-monotonic. Yeah? Other logics, I mean human reasoning doesn't work in a monotonic fashion. Human reasoning works in a non-monotonic fashion in general. As I mentioned earlier, if two people tell me contradictory information, I fail to form an opinion about that topic. So whatever I already believe to be true, I won't be able to believe in the same things. But because this is mathematics, yeah, it's a very crude approximation of human understanding, this is a monotonic logic. Any questions? Okay. So, you are supposed to prove monotonicity in the tutorial. I have already given this problem. Once we know something is a logical consequence, actually, we have a very good test for uh, logical consequence. So let us write that. So I am just going to write it as a proposition. Okay, uh, so the proposition says this. Suppose S is a subset of SL and P is an element of SL. <coughs> Then, T is a logical consequence of S if and only if S union negation T is very good contradictory. So T is a logical consequence, T follows from S. So obviously if I put capital S and negation T together, then I am bound to get a contradiction. Okay, so let us try to prove this. Okay, uh, so what is our proof? <coughs> Suppose is a logical consequence, sorry, T is a logical consequence of S. What does that mean? S union T is satisfiable. Does that, mean, does it mean that? No. See, S itself need not be satisfiable. S itself could be contradictory. 
right? So if we start with this assumption, then S itself could be contradictory or S is satisfiable and then there is a valuation which makes capital S and T both true simultaneously. So uh, are you seeing the proof here? If S is contradictory, then S union negation T is already contradictory. Because the contradictory sets are closed under supersets. Or else, if S is satisfiable, then there is some valuation V which makes S and T sat true. So that particular valuation will not satisfy that. But in logic, yeah, generally we do not write proofs using this way. We will use contrapositive over here. Yeah, so how to write that? So suppose S uh, doesn't logically imply T. Suppose T is not a logical consequence of S. Then what will happen? Then there is a valuation. there is a valuation V such that such that what happens? V of V of capital S is true and V of small t is false. Very good. Then from here what can I conclude? So for this valuation V V of capital S is true and V of negation T is negation T is also true i.e. V of S union negation T is so therefore what can you say about S union negation T? It is satisfiable. So not satisfiable means contradictory. Very simple to understand. So we assume that S uh, logically implies T doesn't happen and we concluded that S union negation T is not contradictory. Yeah, please understand that not contradictory means satisfiable, not tautologous. And not satisfiable means contradictory. Tautologous was anyway too good to be true. Tautologous means it is a bunch of tautologies. Yeah, we don't want to talk about it. This is very rare to happen, being tautologous. Okay, so this is one part. And another part would be, we will again prove using con contrapositive. Yeah? We are not trying to prove anything using contradiction, only contrapositive. So suppose, so the, which side was this? I mean, if I want to write the implication side, which one did we prove right now? Right. So this was this, this implication and now we are going to prove this implication. So suppose S union negation T is not contradictory. What does that mean? Satisfiable. Is satisfiable. Okay, then what will happen? What is the meaning of satisfiability? Then there is a valuation. V such that V of S union negation T is true. Therefore, V of S is true. 
and V of negation T is true. Therefore, V of S is true and V of T is false and therefore S is not logically implying T. Well, actually, it was just the if and only for this. Yeah? But hopefully you understand what we did. Any problems here? Okay, so at this point, perhaps it is appropriate to describe what is a theory. So in mathematics, have you come across some names which are called theories? Cauchy theory. Huh? Cauchy theory. What is meaning of Cauchy theory? I have never heard of that. Complex or some, some introduced like that, like there were... Cauchy theory, I... Sure, like you just said that. Okay, I, I don't know that it's called Cauchy theory, but any other names? Group theory. Group theory, yes. Group theory or? Ring theory, number theory, field theory, linear algebra is also a theory. Category theory. Category theory, okay. And? I mean analysis etc are also theories. Have you heard of theories in physics? Field theory also in physics then? String theory, yes. Then in chemistry have you heard of any theories? Arrhenius theory of acids and bases, yes. So there are so many theories around in each subject. So what is the meaning of theory? Somebody theorizes something, somebody tries to understand some real life phenomenon in case of physics and chemistry or biology and then they try to experimentally show that their, uh, hypo their axioms are true. But it often is the case in case of uh, physics and chemistry theory, like scientific theories, that one theory is not good enough. Yeah? After some point, somebody comes up with some examples in for which this theory doesn't explain anything. It doesn't fit. So therefore, you have to update your theory. You have to go somewhere else, like uh, somewhere deeper, and then come up with a new theory. Then again, until someday, somebody disproves it, it remains valid. And that's how scientific theories develop. In case of mathematics, it's much simpler. Yeah? Mathematics says that it should just be a bunch of statements put together which are simultaneously true somewhere. So basically, a theory is nothing but a satisfiable set of formulas. It's a very simple definition. So whenever we are writing T is a logical consequence of S, if S happens to be satisfiable, then S is a theory and T is a theorem of that theory. So everything is if then. So mathematical theory is simple to understand. So let us write down the definition. <laughs> Given a propositional language L, a subset of SL is a theory if S is satisfiable. Now, 
we don't want to be contradictory. Yeah, that's the only minimum requirement for it to be a theory. And if if S is a theory and uh, T belongs to SL satisfies that T is a logical consequence of S. Then we say that T is a theorem of theory S. So without you knowing, we have been talking about theorems and theories in this lecture. So mathematical theory never tries to impose anything on the real world. It just says, if this, then that. That is the difference between scientific and mathematical theories. Any questions? Okay. So, uh, let me check if something else is remaining from this part. There is, uh, there are a couple of statements which I can write down. Yeah, I mean you will easily see them to be true. I will do them in tutorial, but I should mention them in lectures anyway. So suppose S is a subset of S L, T, T prime, U are particular L formulas. Then first thing, if u is a logical consequence of S, T and T prime together, uh, sorry, I shouldn't even say if, I should just say this, if and only if, U is a logical consequence of S and T convention T prime. And you see, in practice, even though this S appears here, that S is irrelevant. Yeah, what we are really saying, like even if S is empty, if U follows from T and T prime, then U follows from T conjunction T prime. So, yeah, the, nothing much is happening here. Second thing, now this particular statement gives you a connection between logical consequence being an implication and the implication itself. So if U follows from S and T, I mean that happens if and only if, T implies U follows from U, S. So you can see that T just changed size. So basically if S is empty, then what is happening? U follows from T, if and only if T implies U is a tautology. So this logical implication is also less equal sign in the Boolean algebra. Especially when you are just comparing two, two formulas. Okay? Now, uh, if you have understood this, then let me set some background for the syntactic version of the turn style operator. So right now, if I say that T is a theorem of a theory S, or in general I just say T is a logical consequence of capital S, what does that really mean? It says that whenever left hand side is true, then the right hand side is true. 
So everything depends on truth. But now my question is, can we remove dependency on truth altogether? We don't have any true or false. We don't have any human understanding involved. We would like to teach this to a machine. When does T follow from capital S? Well, if I am given P and I am given Q, then I can conclude P. Is there any logic involved in that? Not really. Yeah, I mean I am concluding P from P and Q. Even if I am given P conjunction Q and I am concluding P from that, there is still no logic involved in that. So, if I can develop a set of rules or a bunch of statements which are true, which I, I teach to a computer, then perhaps I can develop a, uh, I mean I shouldn't say theory, but this is a meta level thing. If I develop a theory, to mimic human, human understanding and that is entirely formal. Like if this happens, then that happens. So for example, modus ponens, if I somehow have concluded P implies Q and I have concluded P, then I can conclude Q. Now there is no logic involved. I mean of course there is human understanding involved, but I can formalize this rule. Whenever a computer sees P implies Q and P, okay, conclude Q. So I can abstract out some ideas and write them in the form of rules. Well, these rules are called, termed as calculus. Calculus is just a bunch of rules. Yeah, this is not your usual analysis calculus, but this is a proof calculus. We are going to teach a machine how to write proofs, how to write formal proofs and this is called a deductive calculus. So what does a deductive calculus consist of? It consists of some axioms and it consists of rules of inference. So axioms in this case are just going to refer to something very simple. They will be tautologies. Does anybody have any objection about using tautologies as axioms? And then we will use rules of inference. And then we will formally define what is a proof. So right now we know when T is a logical consequence of capital S. In the next lecture we are going to see when T is a deductive consequence of capital S. And whenever we do that, I mean it's our choice right now. Yeah, At meta level we are working, we are de declaring that a bunch of statements are <coughs> axioms and a bunch of things are rules. Then, the first thing we should ask when we do that, are these bunch of statements true? I mean the axiom should be true. So we are going to choose them as tautologies. And whether the rule of inference is also valid. Right? So rule of inference being valid is has to do with this implication, if this then that. So modus ponens is obviously valid in our brain because if P implies Q is true and if P is true then Q is true. That's valid. So this is the so called soundness theorem. Everything is sound. Sound doesn't mean my sound getting into your ears. Soundness means there is no problem with it. And conversely, which is going to be a major portion of our propositional logic syllabus, that 
whenever d is a logical consequence of s then our deductive calculus is strong enough to provide a proof of t from capital s okay if t is a logical consequence of s then using our rules we can provide a finite length proof of t from capital s that is godel's completeness theorem okay so that's our uh, next plan we are going to follow hilbert style calculus there are different calculi for proof theory also there is natural deduction there is hilbert style but we will follow hilbert style because uh, proving the completeness theorem is easier with hilbert style calculus